We're excited to be here teaching Romans today, and we're in chapter 4, and this is part 11. Uh, I'm Pastor Curtis Hutchinson, and, and I just want to welcome you. Go get your Bibles, your Bibles on your smartphone, follow along today. Again, this is part 11 of chapter 4, and all these teaching sessions that we've done and are doing, uh, even on the teaching of Galatians that we're doing right now, are all being uploaded to our uh, YouTube channel, Curtis Hutchinson 316. So avail yourself to, to that channel there and, and just be blessed as you, as you hear the word of the Lord and hopefully you would allow the Lord to instruct you and grow in His will for your life which always involves the knowledge of God and the grace of God through faith in the cross of Jesus Christ. So where we are in chapter 4 of Romans is... Uh, Verse 19, we'll take off there and move on forward to where we really are. We will do our best to get through this fourth chapter today. Uh, the Lord has really spoken so many things and revealed so many things that, that we just uh, didn't really have a hold of like we should. Some things we didn't even know uh, previously before this teaching. I speak personally for myself. And I hope that you are benefiting from these teachings because, listen, there's no way to live, Jesus said, except by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, the Word of God. Because we live by faith and faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Romans 10 and 17 tells us that. Jesus said in Matthew 4 and 4, man does not live by bread alone. That's only physical living, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The Word of God is our life if that's what our faith is in, in its proper context, which is Christ Jesus and Him crucified. Praise God. So we see here we're reading about Abraham. Paul is writing to the church in Rome here and, he, and he's reminding them uh, of, of so many things in this letter. Uh, and, and we'll get back to where in verse 22 and 23 where Paul really brings it back to a personal note. He's been preaching and, and teaching all, uh, all the way since uh, uh, somewhere in chapter 1. He's just been declaring and teaching and saying <coughs> many things that are the truth that the church there and we as well need to know. But he finally brings it home back to a personal level and we'll get to that in just a minute. So let's start in verse 19 together today. And being not weak in faith, everybody say in faith. In faith. It's a place. It's a place. In faith. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. And if you'll remember last session, we covered that, how in Genesis 17 and 17, the Bible says that God told Abram, his wife Sarah was going to have a child. Abram fell on the ground and laughed. And in his heart, he, he, was, he was doubting this. This is when he was 99, a year earlier. But then God confirms it more specifically to him. No, I'm going to give you a son through Sarah, and you're going to call his name Isaac, which means laughter. Abraham wants to laugh. God will give him a laugh. He'll give him the son he's promised through Isaac. And he said, and I'll make my covenant with him, not Ishmael. Ishmael are the Arab nations. I'll make my covenant with Isaac. He confirmed and got more specific to help Abraham, listen, in faith. Abraham had to believe God. And, and let me say this today. As we, as we read verse 20, I'll say something. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong. Here it comes again. Abraham was strong. The only place anybody can be strong in the eyes of the Lord is in faith. In faith means we've heard God, we've believed God, and, and it's all based on the redemptive plan of God. Listen, God's not going to speak anything to anybody that's not attached to, related to, in focus of, uh, empowered by what Jesus did at Calvary. It's not going to happen. 
This story we're reading right now, Paul is trying not to bring everybody back to just the thoughts of Abraham, but back to a, a focus on what Abraham was believing, how, what made his faith, faith legitimate with God. It was all based on the covenant. God is mindful of His covenant. The only way He can be mindful of any people is if He gets them in His covenant. That's what He's mindful of. When the Bible says He's mindful of His people, that's because His people, He's called them to His covenant and those people have come to Him through way of faith in the promise who is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And what He did at Calvary. So the Bible says He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, he never went as far as to not believe God and just throw it out. He never, but he did. He, he, we read uh, Genesis 17. He fell on his face, the Bible says, and laughed. He struggled. He struggled. But the Bible says he staggered not. He never threw it out. He never just gave up. He never walked away. And when he was a hundred years old, the Bible said in verse 19, it was then that he was found not weak in faith. He was believing God and he considered even not his own body dead. Now at a hundred. Or Sarah's womb, his, his, his 90 year old wife. He, 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 his faith had been strengthened. And in verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith. Let's say something else about that in faith today. It speaks of a faith in that sacrifice, the redemptive plan of God. It's the only place that faith exists. There are many out there teaching, no, you just have to have faith in God's Word. But, but we always, and, and, and I hope you're being equipped on these broadcasts to be able to answer correctly when people try to separate Christ and His work at the cross from the written Word of God. Number one, Jesus said in John 5 and 39, you search the Scriptures. In them you think you have life, but they are they which testify of me. So therefore, but then he goes on and says, but you won't come to me. Listen, unless our faith is in Christ and what He did at Calvary, our faith cannot even be in the written Word of God. Our faith has to first at every moment, not at one time when we were born again. Today, right now, faith is the substance of those things we're hoping for, the evidence of things not seen. Right now, faith is, the Bible says. So, our faith has to always flow to and through the cross, the redemptive plan of God for anything in the Word to be found functioning in our lives by the Holy Spirit revealing the, act, the legitimacy, the, 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 the focus of God's Word. Jesus, He said it was Him. The Scriptures are about Him. Hallelujah. And, and what it, is it about Jesus? We need to know what He did at Calvary. Praise God. That's where all the blessings flow from God through Him, through the cross, our faith in His redemptive plan, His sacrificial work there. That is what makes the Word of God uh, come alive to us. Praise God. Jesus is the living Word. And He's the only one through our faith in what He did at Calvary that can make the Word alive. So I hope you're being equipped and you let people know that all God's words are in righteousness. Proverbs 8 and 8, write it down, go look it up. Don't just say, well, I don't know. Or, oh, yeah, that's good. Or, no, write it down. Make it a part of your ministry. Make it a part of your life. You have to learn these things. You have to know these things. Just telling somebody something, you need to give them somewhere to go look. All God's words, every word He's ever spoken is in righteousness. That doesn't just mean that they're right. They're in a place. They're in righteousness. And righteousness is only located in Christ Jesus. And righteousness only flows to us by grace through the death of Jesus. Not just in our initial salvation, but every single day. Only if our faith is in the sacrifice of Christ do we receive the grace that brings with it the righteousness of God. Not for Christians who are already uh, have a righteous status before God in Christ at the right hand of the Father, but for us to be able to be led in the path of righteousness to bear forth the fruits of righteousness. It doesn't just happen because we're 
we're saved, it happens because we fight the good fight of faith to continue to lay hold on eternal life and His name is Jesus. And the way we touch Him daily and walk with Him daily is the same way we met Him and came to know Him which is through faith in His cross. So when the Bible says Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith. In faith. In faith. Listen, here's the result of being in faith. Giving glory to God. Let me say this. Abraham's faith is nothing to boast about because it had everything to do with God. In faith is a place we exist because we believe the Word of God in its redemptive context. Always make sure you know that. It's not just opening the Bible and believing a word. It has to be in its redemptive context because because only in its redemptive, only through faith in the cross, can it be heard properly, understood, received, and walked in. Because righteousness, all God's words are in righteousness. And unless we're hearing them in their righteous context, which means through faith in the cross, then we're not hearing them properly. We're not going to be able to walk by faith. And we're going to be walking based on our own works, how much we read today, what we did today, and all our self-righteousness instead of the righteousness of Christ being manifest in our lives. It's the fruits of His righteousness. So when I say Abraham's faith is nothing to boast about, I mean that. It's because Abraham didn't even boast in his faith. He boasted in his God. He gave glory to his God because God had given him a promise. And God, he believed, was going to carry it out. So God gave the promise. God even stirred his heart and helped him, stirred him along, kept confirming uh, uh, over and over again through uh, more specific words along the way, just like he'll do with you if you'll let all that stuff go you've been believing. The purpose driven, the government of 12, the promise keepers, all the things that men have come along and tried to tell us that God uses when God uses one thing and it's the preaching of the cross. That's what God uses. We don't need programs and activities and, and, and all sorts of things. And you might be saying, well, why do we have Sunday school then? That's a program. Yes. And it's legitimate if it's a Sunday school program pointing people to the cross. Promise keepers didn't point people to the cross. Promise keepers pointed men to each other, to be accountable to each other. And you say, what's wrong with that? Well, it moves our faith from what God did in Christ at Calvary to men, friends, brother. I need to call them. I'm about to step off in a big piece of stupid. I need to call my brother and he can can talk me through it. You can do this. We can make it together. That doesn't work, my friend. Because that's not what Jesus did. And the government of 12, trying to go get 12 disciples under you because Jesus had 12 under him, that's not anywhere in the Bible. All these unbiblical things that men use and, 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 and twist and pervert Scripture and move the Scripture out of its redemptive plan. Remember, here's you another confirmation about the, the, the Word of God have, having to be in a redemptive context, the righteous context of Christ is that James called the Word of God the law of liberty. And we've only been liberated one place, at Calvary, through the death of Jesus, our faith in that alone. And therefore, if our faith is not in that, the Word of God cannot become our law of liberty. It cannot become our law of faith. It can just become a law that we're doing and doing and just trying to be good old boys and at least I did this today and you know, and tomorrow I'll try to do that. And, and doing good is a good thing. Doing good is a good thing. But unless your faith is in the sacrifice of Christ, I'm not talking about it used to be when you got saved. I'm talking about today, right now, faith is there. And when you step into the reality of this, you will leave that place where the preacher's not preaching this. You will leave that place where they're not teaching the focus. If the focus is not the sacrifice, the focus is really not the Word. 
The focus may be the Word, but it's out of context. The focus has to be the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ right now today, even in the New Testament. Listen, and preachers and Christians alike will say, well, we're past the cross. Well, I guess the Old Testament saints could have said, well, we're not there yet. We're not the, he's not come yet. So fooey on that, it's no different than the Christians today saying, I'm past that. There's no different. No, the focus and the object of what God will work in and what God speaks through is the sacrificial system he set up. Amen. Amen. Somebody said amen. You know, God in these last days, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says he's speaking in these last days by son. And Hebrews 12 and 24 gives us that. Let's turn over there this morning because we can. Take notes, write it down. You need to know these things to be able to share these things with most of the church is confused, doesn't know the word. And if you'll begin to share the word with them and when they say things that aren't right, unbiblical, and you have the truth, just share it with them in a loving way. Well, the Bible says this, and, 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 and it keep going, and, and the Lord will do the rest. Amen? He's doing that, even if you'll just let Him do it through you. <clears throat> Hebrews 12 and 24 reveals what it means by God speaks to us in these last days by His Son. Watch this, Hebrews 12 and 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that He shed for us at Calvary. His death is that's what God is speaking by His Son through. A, another confirmation that all God's words are in righteousness, Proverbs 8 and 8, and the righteousness of God is only imputed, imparted to men through our faith in the death of Jesus. Galatians 2, 21, 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. Write it down. You need it. It needs to be there. You need to have it in your heart to be able to share these things. The church is way off track. They're in gimmicks and schemes and the wiles of the devil that appease the flesh, and they need to come back to the cross where their flesh was crucified and they can live the cross life. They can live in this place where their faith is legitimate and God can honor their faith. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you some good stuff today and I'm learning it. I'm thankful for it. I'm be becoming more and more thankful every day. But Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith giving glory to God and being fully persuaded, fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. Think about that. He was fully persuaded that what God had promised he was also able to perform. Now, think about this. First of all, he had to believe God. And Abraham's faith wasn't just about a promise. His faith was in God. That, we need to get back to that. That's what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews, I believe it's 6, uh, Hebrews 11, verse 6, that, that it's impossible to please God without faith, but they that come to God must believe, first of all, that He is. Number two, then, after we believe He is, that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. Look at Abraham. His faith wasn't just in a promise, exclusively in a promise. His faith was in the God. His God, the God that had approached him and brought him out of uh, Ur of the Chaldees. The, his, Abraham's faith was in God, and then God had a promise, and Abraham got to the place where he finally, the Bible says he was fully persuaded you got to trust in God first. You've got to know God first. And then the things that God has for you, th then you can experience them first. You've got to have faith in God. And that happens through f having faith in Christ and what He did at Calvary. And then the promises that we experience are all in Christ. Yes and amen. Praise God. And verse 22 says, And therefore it was imputed to Him for righteousness, because He believed God, not worked for it. He couldn't work for it. He tried that with Hagar. Sarah, his wife's handmaiden, didn't work for him. God had to show up and say, no, it's not going to be through Ishmael. If you read back in Genesis 17 and 15 through 18, right in there, where Abraham is told by God he's going to give his wife Sarah a, a, a son, 
And Abraham falls on the ground and laughs and, and says in his heart, he's thinking, this is impossible, this, this, is, this is crazy. And he gets up and he tells the Lord, you know, oh, Ishmael will walk before you all the days of his life or something along those lines. You go back and read it. He's still hung up thinking Ishmael is the one. And God confirms and gets more specific. No, I'm going to give your wife Sarah a child. His name's going to be Isaac. Laughter. Just what you did. Laugh. Think about that. And I'm going to make my covenant with him. God gets more specific. If you'll just believe that God is through faith in what Christ did for you at Calvary, then you'll begin to walk by that same faith in the promises that God has for you. You have to believe God is, He exists, and every person on the planet knows that God is, even those that call themselves atheists, that God calls them fools because they say in their heart there is no God. But let me tell you, it don't matter what you say in your heart, God put eternity in every human being's heart when He formed them and fashioned them in their mother's womb. The Bible says that. Write it down, take a note, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. The Bible says He put the worlds in their hearts. All the people. He put, he put the world. Let's, let's turn over there and look at it. If I can get there. It, it's right after the book of Proverbs in Ecclesiastes. Here it is. I got it highlighted. God has made everything beautiful in His time. So you wasn't supposed to live 200 years ago. You're supposed to be here now. Also, He has set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God makes from the beginning to the end. Think about that. When the Bible says he has, he has set the world in their heart, that word world, if you'll go look it up, it means ages. It means eternity. He has put, he has put the ages. He has put the eternal working of His hands in our, in our heart. That's why every person within their own heart, who they are, the deepest part of them, knows that there is a God and that there is something coming when they lay this old body down. That's why there's a, a million, million religions on the planet and always has been. Somebody, everybody's worshiping something, even if it's their own selves. It, uh, that we're, we're created as worshipers of God to worship God. God, and we may not do it, but we know there's a God. Everybody on the planet always has known there's a God and know, and know there's more than what their eyes can see. So he was fully persuaded, Abraham, that what God had promised he was also able to perform. And then verse 22 and 23, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. You see that? Abraham believed God. And it's not when we work, but it's when we believe that God imputes us the status of righteous in Christ Jesus. It's all about the redemptive plan, my friends. And then after we're born again and we begin to walk in faith in God's Word in its redemptive context, God then even brings forth the fruits of of the righteousness of Christ. Hallelujah. But notice in verse 23, uh, uh, Paul, the Spirit of God through Paul, begins now to do something he's not done since chapter 1, uh, and, and that is bring it right back to you personal. He's been declaring, he's been teaching and preaching, and but now he brings it personal. Watch this. Now it was not written for Abraham's sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, everybody say, I'm one of them. Him, for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. You have to believe that God sent his son and that God sent him to die for your forgiveness of sins, the atonement for your sins. You're guilty, you're a sinner, and, you, and he sent his son because he loves you to forgive you and to deliver you of your sins and to make you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and a long list of other wonderful things. You have to believe God loves you so much He gave His Son for you to die on the cross. You must believe on Him that God raised up our Lord from the dead. 
You must believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Anybody that even says they believe in Jesus and what He did at Calvary, but they don't believe He was raised from the dead, they don't really believe in what He did at Calvary because without the resurrection, the cross really meant nothing. He had to be raised from the dead to justify what He did at the cross. He atoned for every single sin, the mass murders, the mass rapings, any the worst sin, all sin. No matter what you could say, who you could point out, all the sin in the world, He gave His life for all of that so all men could be free, delivered, saved from sin. Glory to God. He did that. And the proof that it worked, the justification, what justified the cross was the resurrection. Hallelujah. Now, amen. Romans 1 and 4, we read it at the very beginning of this teaching way back some time ago. Let's read it. Chapter 1, Romans, verse 4, talking about Jesus, was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. His, his resurrection was the declaration of a perfect sacrifice. It was the declaration that the cross worked. If every sin had not been atoned for, paid for by His blood, the grave would have held Him like it held every other man. That's why the Bible says the, the resurrection was the declaration of the perfection of His sacrifice. That's what it says. Let's, let's read on now, trying to make it through chapter 4. You guys keep holding me up. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on Him, Jesus, that, that really it's not talking about Jesus in that sense. It's talking about God, the Godhead, God the Father. Let's read it again. For unto us, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe. It's personal. It's to you today. If you believe this, what Abraham believed, if you believe on Him... God the Father, you must believe that God is and that He rewards those that diligently seek Him. Us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on Him, God the Father, that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Think about that. Who was delivered for our offenses. He was given for our offenses. He was raised up on the cross for our offenses. Our sins. He had no sin. He did not become a sinner. You can throw that Kenneth Copeland and, and uh, Kenneth Hagin and all those other people, false prophets, liars, lost, don't know the Lord because if the cross was his defeat and they teach that, then they're defeated because that's what they believe. And they don't believe the cross is where Jesus gained our victory. That means they still don't have it. The victory comes through the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah not anything after the cross. The cross, hallelujah, and the resurrection just declared and justified that the cross did work. The cross by the blood, Romans 5, 1 and 9 tells us we're justified by the blood. So when we read in verse 25, Jesus who was delivered for our sins and was raised up again for our justification doesn't mean we're, ju we're justified by the resurrection. No, it means the resurrection was justified by the cross, was justified rather by the resurrection. Because the Bible plainly states as he continues to write this letter in the very next verse, remember the Bible wasn't written in chapter and verse, it was just written in letters. So when you continue to read in chapter 5, and we'll start there this next Monday morning at 8.30 a.m. right here where we are today, hopefully, uh, it says we're justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through our Lord Jesus Jesus Christ is explained in verse 9, chapter 5. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. So we're justified by the blood of Jesus, what He did at the cross. His work on the cross justified us to have the right to be forgiven of our sins. For there we became the righteousness of God in Him through His death, through faith in His death. God imputed through our belief in Him 
right his righteousness to us and justified us. But watch, let's read verse 25 again. Who was delivered for our offenses, our sins, and was raised again for our justification. You know, the resurrection was God's message to you and me that says, I told you so. Jesus told him he was going to be raised from the dead after he was uh, uh, put to death by the, the religious rulers in Jerusalem. He told them, they're, they're going to, they're going to uh, 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 kill me. They're going to crucify me. They're going to, they're, they're going to do what they do. But, but I'll be back in three days. And that, my friends, the resurrection is what, ju is, it the, is what justified the cross work. Again, let me say it today as I close. If Jesus would not have been raised from the dead, then the cross wouldn't mean anything to us. But the focus of our faith isn't, is not the resurrection, though we believe and testify of the resurrection. The object of our faith is the sacrifice. And we know that because the Bible doesn't teach that the preaching of the resurrection is the power of God. It teaches that 1 Corinthians 1.18 that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But it is the power of God to us who are being saved. It doesn't say the resurrection took the power of death away from the devil. It says that Jesus through his death took the power of death away from the devil. Hebrews 2.14 Think about that. The object of our faith is the sacrificial system of God, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It is through that alone that God imputes righteousness. That in that alone. So therefore we must see every word in the Bible through that righteous context because it is truth will be imparted by the Holy Spirit who is truth to us so that we can experience the righteous fruits of Jesus Christ. Our faith is nothing to boast in because it is the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. We boast in the cross. God forbid that we boast in anything other than the work of the cross of Jesus Christ. Glory to God, I'm out of time. Don't forget to go to the YouTube channel, Curtis Hutchinson 316, and avail yourself to all the teaching there. And until next time, be determined to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified.